I'd like to take up one other question, which is always of interest to people outside philosophy, as well as in it, and which was of special interest to philosophers in the Middle Ages. And that concerns the question of what, what extent we have free will. Uh, in the Middle Ages, it was particularly important to uh, Christian thinkers because of the doctrine of grace. Uh, the doc according to the doctrine of grace, it, it simply is not up to us as individuals whether to secure our own salvation. I mean, whether or not we will be saved depends at least in part on divine grace. But if that is so, then to what extent do we have free will in any respect that matters? I mean, that, that was, in, in a way, the nub of the problem. Can you tell us something about that? Well, there were two problems in the Middle Ages interwoven, but one of them a philosophical problem and one a theological problem. The philosophical problem was the problem of reconciling divine foreknowledge and human freedom. Because uh, not only medieval philosophers, but most ancient philosophers and uh, Islamic philosophers who had considered the nature of God uh, thought that one of the things that we knew about God, if we knew anything about him at all, was that he could foretell the future, that he knew what was going to happen in the future. Well, of course, if we're free, if you and I are free, it looks as if what you and I decide to do today um, is what determines what's going to be the future tomorrow. But if God already knows what you and I are doing tomorrow, how can we be free to decide that today? Now, that's a problem which arises for anybody who believes in an omniscient God at all, whether or not they believe in anything that the Bible says about God. But there was a special problem for Christians, especially for Christians who took the version of Christianity presented by St. Augustine, uh, because St. Augustine, particularly in his later days, lays enormous emphasis on the fact that, uh, on the doctrine that nobody achieves salvation, goes to glory in heaven, unless they're predestined to do so uh, by God. And that was an extra problem for Christians. But what is interesting philosophically is that the patient work which was done by the theologians and philosophers in the Middle Ages, unraveling the concepts of freedom and the concepts of determinism to try to show uh, that the two are, can be reconciled, these are replicated, often in ignorance today, by people who are not interested in God at all, but are interested in determinism, and physical scientific determinism. Scientific scientific determinism. Yes. But the actual logical moves, which somebody in the 20th century will use who's trying to reconcile physical determinism with our experience of freedom, will be the same steps being gone through as somebody in the 14th century trying to reconcile divine predestination with human freedom. Alas, we're going to have to draw this discussion to a close. If uh, anything that we've said stimulates some of our viewers to go off and try and read some medieval philosophy, no doubt in most cases for the first time in their lives, have you any advice that you give them about where to start? I think that they, there are not many medieval um, works which are easy for beginners. This is because of what I said about most of the great works being within a university tradition. They are highly tough, technical. Universe, highly technical university yeah. textbooks. But there are two short books that one could pick out. The first is the one you yourself began with, Augustine's Confessions. I think that's a wonderful work. Well, it's one of the greatest autobiographies ever written, and I think it's probably the first autobiography in the modern sense ever yeah. written. Uh, it's full of a great deal of personal reflection of... Uh, tender uh, memory of his family, of uh, insight into his own childhood and his own development. But it also moves on to the most abstract levels of philosophizing at the end of it, raising questions about the nature of time, which are still very much alive. Uh, the other book which I would recommend is the Proslogion uh, of St. Anselm, uh, which is the book in which he presents that ingenious argument for the existence of God that I tried to paraphrase earlier mm -hmm. on. I think your readers might find this interesting to, to look at that book. It only takes an afternoon to read uh, and see whether they think I represented his argument rightly and see whether they find it convincing. I said right at the beginning of this discussion in my introduction that for a long time medieval philosophy has been the Cinderella of the subject and there's no doubt that that has been true in the past. 
But I'm also beginning to get the impression of, that, that, that and your own writings are perhaps one of the swallows that presage this summer, that there are all the signs of a revival of interest, a serious revival of interest, not quite perhaps with us yet, but on the way. Do you perceive that? Of course, it's only true of Anglo-American philosophy uh, that medieval philosophy has been a Cinderella. Uh, on the continent, medieval philosophy has been thriving for uh, as a, a subject of study for quite a long time. I think that the revival in English-speaking philosophy at the moment is particularly in America, uh, where there's a great revival of interest in all things medieval, not just in medieval philosophy. Thank you very much, Anthony Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.